So, volunteers, you may go ahead with the proceedings. As Stephen Hawkins has quoted, science is only not only a discipline of reason, but also of romance and passion. With this, a very warm good evening to one and all present here, respected dignitaries and my dear friends. I welcome you all on Can you board. turn on your video, Swati? Sir, my uh, uh, net has some issues, that's why. Okay, fine. I welcome you all on board to the L4 series talk section on RF Aspects of Magnetic Resonance Imaging by Robert Cleverly, organized by IEEE APS and MTTS Kerala chapter in collaboration with IEEE APS and MTTS Student Branch chapter of Government Engineering College, Parton Hill. All the participants are re uh, requested to mute your mic throughout the meeting. In case of any queries, do feel free to contact either the host or the co-host directly. I now hand over to Kitya. Now welcome uh, Mr. Ajit Mitra sir, scientist at VSSC and the secretary of IEEE MTTS Kerala chapter to address the welcome note. Handing over to you sir. Okay, uh, good evening, very good evening and good morning to everyone. So on behalf of MTTS Kerala chapter, I welcome all of you to today's L4 uh, lecture event. Uh, actually, uh, this our uh, the path of webinar started in 2020 when the whole country was in lockdown. And from that, there were several events one after another, which got a very good response and got recognized at various levels. So now today we are very, very fortunate to have with us Dr. Robert H. Cavalry of Villanova University. And uh, he's going to deliver a talk on RF aspects of magnetic resonance imaging. We are very grateful to have you, sir, and on behalf of our chapter, we welcome you and we are really eagerly waiting for your talk. I also welcome Dr. Tinban Shaha, who is the founder and immediate past chair of MPTS Kerala and also past chair of APS Kerala. And he has been a great leader and guide for all of us. Uh, I welcome you, sir, to this event. And I also welcome all the participants. For, I thank them for uh, res responding to our call and registering for the event. I welcome all of you on, on behalf of my chapter and I'm sure we'll be having a, a great lecture ahead. So uh, with this, I think we start with uh, time to start our event. I'll uh, hand over to the anchors for further proceedings. Thank you, sir. I now welcome Dr. Chinmoy Saha founder and the immediate past chair of MTTS and the past chair of APS and the regional coordinator of APS. Handing over the virtual podium to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, at the outset, firstly, uh, thank you very much once again to Professor Coverley for uh, his kind consent. I have been uh, following up with him for <laughs> quite some time. And finally, we are really glad that he is here with us as an L4 speaker. I just uh, speak a little bit about the L4 initiative. As uh, Sri Arijit Mitra mentioned, we started our uh, pan uh, pandemic initiatives. During the pandemic, we wanted to do something from educational fronts because, as you know, India is a big country and there are so many students. And in some of the colleges, the online teaching facility was also not there at that time. So we thought we'll take uh, some kind of educational initiative and that's what uh, we wanted to combat. That's how we wanted to combat with the virus. And we did several webinars and then uh, kind of got some request that we should have some citizen speakers who have contributed immensely to the technical field and who are very well known. So we came up with a plan. The name was Learn from Leaders and Learn from Legends. Needless to say that today's speaker, uh, Professor Kavarli, is a leader as well as a legend uh, in terms of his work, in terms of guidance, in terms of views, technical contribution, and uh, in terms of serving to the MTT community for several decades. He's a life fellow and many other things that I'll be reading from the biodata. I'm very uh, glad to know that some of our uh, society leaders, like uh, last three presidents, I think uh, Dr. Ala, 
uh, Dr. Uh, Greg Leon, uh, current president, uh, Professor Saunda, had been in our L4 podium. In fact, uh, the president-elect, Professor Nuru, has been also one of the speakers. Apart from that, we had uh, Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay, uh, Professor Shivan Kaur, uh, Dr. Ramesh Gupta, Professor Bozi. Uh, um, all of them have appeared in L4 uh, podium in different ways. And at some point, I, I thought uh, Professor Kavali has been so generous in allowing us to report some of those things in the magazine. And then I know that uh, he's well above L4 in terms of technical contribution. I wrote to him, I think, four to five months before, and he immediately agreed. Due to something and some other points, it got delayed, but finally we are here today. Uh, so that's the L4 initiative piece. And even though we are almost uh, in normal situation, I uh, think with, uh, you know, uh, with decision that you have taken in the chapter level, we'll continue with this L4 initiative, even if we are uh, in normal situation, not in pandemic situation anymore. But it may be sometime physical, it may be uh, offline mode, uh, in-person mode, or sometime hybrid mode. Like uh, today we are having online, but we want to have Professor Coverly and some other speakers uh, in the uh, in-person mode in the airport podium or as a DL speaker, because Professor Coverly is one of the uh, former DL speakers also. And uh, just a few points regarding our chapter. We, it's a very new chapter. It started in 2019. And uh, maybe due to support from the society leaders and due to some of our activities, we got the Outstanding Chapter Award in 2021. So this is a tremendous achievement due to our students. Thank you so much. Uh, and due to our volunteers, a dedicated team uh, led by other people. Uh, in current chapter chair, Professor Apren is not there today, but all of us have grown together. The initiative that I took at that time, I was the uh, APS chair. And while traveling in different parts of India and other places, I was getting requests from students that we want to hear something on microwave circuits, active devices, also, not only on antennas. And then I thought to bring the equality and bring the smooth circuit component, we should have an MTTS chapter also in Kerala. And Professor Cole and other people like Dr. Gautam, uh, Professor Siddiqui, uh, you know, also suggested and helped me a lot. We came up with the chapter. And we are trying to do, uh, you know, cater to the technical needs to our students, volunteers. We have taken some initiative in terms of student guidance, uh, student uh, projects, etc. Also, and uh, Kerala, you know, in terms of IEEE sections, Kerala currently is the largest section. We have almost uh, 12,000 members currently, and either Kerala or Beijing are always in one and two. Sometimes there will be flipping, but currently for last few months we have holding the number one position across the globe. But not only that, we want to grow technically also, not in terms of the membership. We have almost 100 members in NTTS Kerala. We'll uh, increase the membership also. We are trying to take different kinds of initiatives, but also for young students, uh, young uh, scholars, we want to bring more technicality. And I feel this type of initiative, L4 Talk, DL Talks, will uh, bring more uh, technical leverage to our uh, students. So I won't uh, take further time. This is my pleasant duty to introduce uh, Professor Kavarli. He doesn't require any introduction, but it's a formality uh, for me to introduce Professor Kavarli formally. I'll uh, read out his uh, biodata from the flyer which we have circulated. Dr. Kavarli received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore MD in 1983. He has been a faculty member at uh, Villanova University in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering since 1997 and with the rank of professor. Previously, he was a professor for more than 14 years at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Dr. Kavarli's research interests are focused on the characterization of semiconductor devices such as pin diodes and FETs for microwave and RF control in reconfigurable communication, circuits, and medical instrumentation. He has published more than 100 journal and conference papers and is the author of two books, Microwave and RF Semiconductor Control Devices Modeling and CMOS RFIC uh, Design Principle with Artec House. An IEEE Life Fellow, Dr. Kavarli is the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Microwave Magazine, Track Editor for the IEEE Journal of Microbes, 
and a member of the MTTS at COM. He is really very humble that he have made his biodata very brief. I know he's much more than that. And as I said, he is a real L4 speaker. Without any further information, I hand over the podium to Professor Kavandi. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you, Professor Kavandi. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Saha, and uh, I appreciate the very kind, uh, kind introduction. And uh, I see from the participant list here on Zoom that we have a large number of people in attendance. And so welcome and, uh, and good evening uh, uh, to all of you. And I look forward to sharing, uh, sharing some things here that I've been working on over the years. So let's see if this... Uh, Okay, this, you should be able to see my slides. Yeah, we, we do. We do. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you. So um, this is uh, the title of my talk, RF Aspects of Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And uh, at the outset, I'd like to acknowledge two of the people that I uh, have worked with over the years on this. Uh, William Doherty from uh, Microsemi Lowell and Ron Watkins from uh, Stanford University. We were... Uh, we spent many years working together on some aspects of magnetic resonance imaging. And to add to what Dr. Saha said about uh, MTT and the membership, we have, uh, besides the Microwave Magazine, which is now monthly, 12 issues a year, we also have quite a few other publications that uh, helps you stay technically current. Uh, we have a newsletter that's uh, fully electronic and we have our, our flagship transactions on microwave theory and techniques, as well as our, our letters. Uh, a relatively new journal the last five years or so, transactions on terahertz science and technology. And a relatively new, open act, all open access journal, the Journal of Microwaves. And we have a couple of other publications that are joint with other uh, societies we have the uh, such as uh, germ and the numerical modeling uh, journal and as you're well aware being a member of uh, IEEE and the MTTS society uh, it's very good very helpful for career development and there are also uh, scholarships and awards that the uh, MTT society uh, distributes each year and uh, especially for those uh, graduate students who are here or future graduate students. Uh, we have a young professionals program that is very active, not listed on this slide as a women in, in microwaves uh, activity. So there's, there's a lot of career development, a lot of networking opportunities that uh, the MTT can, can provide you. And uh, I, I applaud Dr. Saha and, and everyone else involved with these uh, societies for keeping this at the forefront of, uh, uh, of, of technology, microwave technology in India. So let me go to my, my, uh, my talk now. And uh, the picture that you see here, uh, you may have seen, maybe you, maybe a family member, uh, maybe a friend may have had an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and uh, they were maybe placed inside this kind of uh, structure for for imaging. And it's a very good di diagnostic tool. Uh, it gives images such as shown on the right of very high contrast, very high resolution, but where it's real uh, benefit comes from is the fact that it's not like x-rays that use ionizing, ionizing radiation. MRI is actually a non-ionizing radiation that uses basically lower frequency electromagnetic waves. But uh, one of the things that's interesting about this uh, magnetic resonance imaging system is, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but you can see that this is a very high powered magnet. And we'll talk about why you have to have this high power magnet as we go through the talk. And you can also see that the patient is put inside and the scan is done. But one of the things that is not clear from this is what's on the other side of this nice white casing here that's, uh, that surrounds the instrumentation. And that's kind of what I want to focus on today, because there's actually a lot of electrical engineering and a lot of microwave and RF engineering that actually is going on behind this, uh, behind this casing. 
you can see this up here on top of the casing. You can see this uh, structure going to the ceiling. Turns out there's a huge number of coaxial and other cables that that leave the top of that uh, magnet. So uh, there's a, it's it's not readily apparent, but there's a lot of microwave and RF engineering involved in the MRI process. So what I want to talk about today, uh, for about the next uh, 50 minutes or so, is kind of take you through uh, a little bit of, of background about magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, we're going to look at it from the atomic viewpoint and then get into what's going on electromagnetically at the atomic level and then see how that uh, can be uh, exploited, if you will, to be able to get us an actual image. So we're going to talk about magnetic fields. We're going to talk about uh, magnetic fields, both at very at DC, essentially static magnetic fields, as well as RF excitation magnetic fields. And we're going to talk a little bit about the MRI process. And then we're going to get into the electronic systems that uh, make up the MRI system in terms of RF. And then we're going to get into a little bit on some of the devices and some of the uh, electronics. They're typically, they're sometimes called antennas in MRI, but in many cases, uh, they're coils. So this may, uh, this may confuse some people because the terminology in the magnetic resonance imaging world is a little different than it is in the microwave and RF world. Uh, and then I'm going to draw a conclusion. And the reason I like to spend a, a fair amount of time at the beginning on look at, looking at the actual physical uh, background of this is I think by understanding the underlying physics associated with this phenomenon, it helps to understand the RF design and why you need to make certain choices in the RF design. And so we take a look and go back to our very fundamental look of uh, chemistry that we may have had in, in uh, uh, first year of college. And we know that the uh, the nucleus of the atom is made up of uh, protons and neutrons or nucleons. And if you do a quantum mechanical derivation of the uh, behavior of the, the nucleus, these positive and, and neutral charges, you'll find that uh, as you develop the mathematics, you'll find a uh, phenomenon that actually has the uh, dimensions of angular momentum, same as we might have with a, uh, with a spinning top. And this magnetic, uh, or this uh, angular momentum is a magnetic moment that's associated with each one of these nucleons that's in the nucleus. As a matter of fact, the electron also has this. And because it has the same dimension as angular momentum, it's often called the spin of the, uh, of the nucleon. And this spin uh, has uh, low energy and high energy. And uh, we'll talk about what defines that boundary between low energy and high energy in a minute. But these, uh, these spins are referred to as either a spin up or spin down. And as you can see from the little graphic there on the, the top, we've got this uh, little spinning uh, kind of spin associated with it. And the, uh, the magnetic moment is the, is the arrow that's uh, shown here. Okay. Now, if we are in a, uh, a non-magnetic environment and the uh, material is non-magnetic, and let's take, for example, the human body, which is if we want to image it, we're not magnetic. And so because of that, there's no net uh, magnetic magnet magnetism, and so there's an equal number of spin up and spin down to make everything neutral magnetically. However, if we put the object, put us inside a magnetic field, static magnetic field, and that's what that green arrow represents on the left, uh, a B0 magnetic field, and I have to say, I'm gonna be using the term magnetic field and magnetic flux pretty interchangeably. Uh, but if we put an object in a static magnetic field, what happens is you actually have the magnetic moments of the nucleons aligning with that static magnetic field. And the lower energy ones tend to uh, more align themselves than the higher energy ones. And so the lower energy ones, which are denoted by, say, the blue 
uh, the blue uh, nucleons there have a spin up and the higher energy ones kind of counteract or go against that magnetic field. And they're there, the red ones, and they're referred to as spin down. Now, if you see the equation on the right, N minus is the number of spin down and N plus is the number of spin up. And you notice in the equation in the exponential, there's the magnetic field, magnetic flux B. So the more magnetic flux, more magnetic fields you have, the higher the magnetic field strength, the more spin up atoms or nucleons you have than spin down. Now, what happens is you then with this difference in spin up and spin down, you actually have a net magnetization and that's that sort of larger red arrow in the bottom center. You have a net magnetization vector that whose magnitude is dependent on those, the difference in those numbers of spin up and spin down. So the more magnetic field you apply static magnetic field B, the, uh, the higher the net magnetization vector, that larger that NMV. And that's important because that is the parameter, that is the structure, that is the vector that we are actually going to measure when we actually do an MR, uh, when we actually do an image. Now, in that exponential, there's a couple of familiar terms, H um, being, um, okay, H and KT, uh, but gamma there is referred to as the gyromagnetic ratio. And it turns out that gyromagnetic ratio is a very interesting parameter that, that we'll see as we go along. So when you put a tissue into the, to a strong magnetic field, like into the bore of the magnet that I showed at the very beginning, the magnetic moments align parallel or anti-parallel and the difference provides that net magnetization vector. So I'm gonna have, I don't know if how well you can see this on my, in my camera, but we've got this net magnetization for here, and it is processing around the magnetic field. Okay, it's processing around the magnetic field. Uh, but as it, or this procession around the magnetic field is actually at a very, at a characteristic frequency. And that's what's, and that characteristic frequency is defined by the Larmor equation here which is omega is equal to gamma, the gyromagnetic ratio times the magnetic field strength. So the processing magnetic moments are functions of magnetic field strength. So not only is the strength of the net magnetization vector a product of the field strength, but so is the frequency of this procession. The higher the magnetic field strength, the higher the frequency of procession. And the constant of proportionality between the two is that gyromagnetic ratio, gamma. Now, notice that that equation for, for gamma Q over 2M, it depends on the mass. And as we know from, from chemistry, uh, each individual atom has a different atomic numbers. And uh, so therefore it has different masses. And this is very important because that implies that that gyromagnetic ratio, that gamma term there, is different for each atomic species, including isotopes. And that's very important because for a fixed magnetic field strength, like that magnet I showed at the very beginning of the, of the lecture, that magnetic field is static. It doesn't change. What does change is that gyromagnetic ratio of all the individual elements. For hydrogen, which is by far the most uh, widely imaged atom, uh, because it's the main constituent of water, H2O, that gyromagnetic ratio, that is the rate that that magnetization vector changes, is about 42 and a half megahertz per Tesla. So if I put someone in a one Tesla magnetic field, that procession is going to be 42 and a half megahertz for hydrogen. It's going to be 40 megahertz for fluoride 19. Same magnetic field, different gyromagnetic ratio, different procession of the net, uh, net magnetization vector around B0. So as you increase that magnetic field, two things happen. One is you increase the procession frequency and you increase 
the strength of the net magnetization vector. Now, like I said before, hydrogen is very plentiful in the human body, and so it's probably the, uh, the, the target species for like 85 or 90 percent of the images. And it's also very plentiful. I think it's 75 to 80 percent of the human body is made up of water. But other uh, atomic species can be imaged as well. Uh, sodium is helpful in biological processes, so it can be used for uh, uh, MRIs of heart disease or cancer. Uh, if you're interested in lung and lung function, you might use uh, helium or xenon. Those are both inert gases, and so they're not going to interact with the lung tissue itself, but they will give a very strong MRI signal. Fluorine, phosphorus, all of those have different gyro magnetic ratios and uh, different frequency characteristics. Now, here's where the RF actually comes in, because if we apply an RF field, for example, a RF pulse, that's at the same frequency as the Larmor precession frequency, again, two things occur. One is that the magnetic moments all sort of align themselves. And the second is that precession that we had, and if you look at the graph on the right, we have the longitudinal plane. What happens is with that applied magnetic field, that precession actually winds up moving into the longitudinal plane. So in other words, that net magnetization vector is flipped away from its equilibrium into another plane. And the RF pulse amplitude as well as its uh, duration will actually cause that net magnetization vector to flip uh, any number of any number of degrees. Most of the time, and most of this explanate the explanations I provide here, I'm going to talk about a 90 degree flip angle, which means it goes completely from the longitudinal plane into the transverse plane, and it is still spinning at that characteristic Lorimer frequency rate, which is 42 and a half megahertz for hydrogen. And that's very important because that explains what you need to then pick up this uh, net magnetization vector from being, being radiated from the atoms themselves. Because if you see, if this net magnetization here is in the transverse plane, as this moves around this circle here, and you can see the, uh, the coil, that net magnetization vector will then change, will be interpreted as a changing magnetic field. And so by Faraday's law of induction, as that net magnetization vector sweeps by the plane of that coil, you get an induced EMF. And so basically you can pick up the signal from a collection of atoms at that Larmor frequency. Now, the level of that uh, uh, induced EMF is a function of the net magnetic field strength uh, of the RF, which is sometimes referred to as the B1 field, as well as the strength or the, uh, uh, of the net magnetization vector. So a higher magnetic field B0 will give you a higher net magnetization vector, which will give you a higher EMF, which will give you a larger signal. And of course, higher RF power will also in some way give you a higher ENF. Now, what's interesting is we're actually getting signals back from atoms. And so it's it's very it's going to be very weak. And so anything you need you can, you can do to increase that signal strength uh, and or reduce the noise that's inherent in the body, because remember the body is at about 30, 37 centigrade. And so there's thermal noise coming from the body. Anything you can do to improve that signal to noise ratio is very helpful. Now, as soon as the RF disappears, the uh, that magnetization vector wants to go back to equilibrium. And that happens with both interactions between the nucleons and each other, as well as the nucleons and the lattice. And those have two different definitions that are referred to as T1 and T2 uh, decay. And after a period of time, that net magnetization vector goes from the transverse plane back to the longitudinal plane. 
it'll be now 90 degrees with that coil, and so you won't uh, you won't be able to to detect it. That time though is on the order of a second. Okay, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit less, but it's on the order of about one second. So it's not exactly a quick decay, uh, but it's also not exactly short either. And uh, it, it's different for each of the tissues. So if you apply an RF magnet uh, field at the Larmor frequency and you want to receive the Larmor frequency simultaneously, that's going to be very difficult because the high power transmitter is going to overwhelm the small receive signal. But when you turn the RF power off, you could then have a short period of time where you could look at that RF signal being detected. Now, here's where the actual imaging process, uh, I'm going to talk about that in the next couple of slides. So if we had that, you know, big magnetic field with the, with the bore that I showed you where the patient could go in, that was one of the first slides. If we put the patient inside that magnetic field bore, and it's very similar if you have either a closed or open MRI system, all the net magnetization vectors in the human body will then align with the magnetic field as I showed earlier. And then of course, just described, if we apply this uh, RF pulse, you're gonna flip all those net magnetization vectors. And that's what the bottom graphic shows. Top graphic shows no applied RF field, the bottom shows the applied RF field. But the problem is, in this case, not only do you flip all the net magnetization vectors, uh, you know, not only do you flip the net magnetization vectors, but you flip them all. And so you sort of don't know wh which one's which. And uh, we have to talk about then how do you, you know, look at that net magnetization from a particular region. And uh, this is where uh, Paul Altebur actually won the Nobel Prize for was coming up with the idea that instead of having a not or instead of not just having the static magnetic field, why don't we actually use what's referred to as a magnetic field gradient? So in other words, here we have our strong magnetic field, V0, which is being shown from left to right. But then we'll have a separate magnet, or as it turns out, separate magnets that will give us down towards the feet, a little smaller magnetic field and up towards the head, a little higher magnetic field than B0. And it'd be linearly changing in between. And so the magnetic field strength B becomes this static magnetic field strength plus this small changing gradient. Remembering the Larmor equation, that is omega was general magnetic ratio times B, Notice B is now a function of position. So that makes the frequency a function of position. So the frequency of the signals that come back from the human body are functions of that position based on that gradient. And if it works in that one dimension, it's gonna work in the other dimensions as well. So you've got one here in the Z dimension and you could have gradients in X and Y. And so that you could essentially use frequency to describe position of that net magnetization vector. Okay, so the gradients are very important because they basically encode physical location and map it into a frequency. Now, further, we said if we applied an RF pulse, we get uh, at, at the Larmor frequency, we get the net magnetization vectors to flip. But now if we apply a narrow band RF pulse, and that's shown here uh, towards the bottom, we have a, a narrow band RF pulse whose frequency F0 is the Larmor frequency, but it has a little bit lower bandwidth and higher bandwidth. If that frequency domain RF pulse is applied, correctly, then what happens is you only get the net magnetization vectors to flip in a particular region. And that's why in the little figure of the human body, you only see the net magnetization vectors in the torso flipped because the Larmor frequencies are only matched in that area. And that small region is referred to as the slice. So you're actually taking a slice, the 
width of which is determined by both the gradient and the bandwidth of the RF pulse. And that's the, only the region that you're going to get this flip net magnetization vector, and it's only the region where you're going to get that signal coming back. Now, I've shown just that one RF pulse for the torso. I could have a lower RF pulse that might uh, only flip those in the leg area or a slightly higher RF pulse in frequency that may only flip the net magnetization vectors in, in the head. So just depending on what the RF signal looks like, both in terms of center frequency and bandwidth, I can look at various regions of the body. And sometimes I can look at uh, multiple regions of the body simultaneously. Now, as soon as you start talking about uh, very band limited pulses, you start talking about very complex time waveforms. And so the time domain pulse is complex. If there's any spreading out of that RF pulse in frequency, you start getting uh, uh, less resolution in the slice. So the interaction between the RF pulse, the gradient, and the slice width is very important, and that's one of the things that's going to have an impact on the electronics that's actually used here. So, like I said before, if the gradients are, you know, helpful to give you that uh, gradient in the Z direction for position encoding, the other two dimensions are, can be done as well. And so there's a multiple step process here in the MRI where you actually have three different uh, processes going on for the three dimensions. There's the slice selection, phase encoding, and the third uh, part is the frequency encoding and, and actually the readout. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So this is a, a, a very uh, simplistic diagram, but it shows that you have an RF pulse, and that helps select the slice that I just talked about. And that RF pulse, you know, is, has a certain center frequency, certain bandwidth, for, and it interacts with the gradient to select a region of, of interest. And then the RF pulse is turned off, and very quickly you go through the phase encode and frequency code encode signals. And there you actually have slice select, which is a Z, and then X and Y are handled in the phase and frequency encode. And remember, once we turn that RF pulse off, we start losing signal. And you can see that in, in, the, uh, in the sort of the three uh, six, uh, receive signals below. So what I'm going to do is show a little uh, graphic here with a little uh, animation that kind of shows what's going on. So here, the slice select, that means we've got all the net magnetization vectors, and hopefully you can, uh, you can see that. And in that slice region, that all the net magnetization vectors are rotating at the same phase and at the same frequency. Okay, so we sele selected our slice. That's the first RF pulse. And then on the second one, and here I show the gradient in the, in the X direction, we've done the slice select, and then we actually have our gradient going from left to right, which means we have lower field on the left, higher field on the right, and so each one of these net magnetization vectors here are going to have a slightly different frequency uh, as you go from left to right. They're going to be the same in each column, but as you go from left to right, the frequencies are going to increase. So for the slice select, all the frequencies are the same. In the next measurement or the next part of the procedure, you have the phase encoding, and they all have uh, in the column, they have a slightly different Larmor frequency. And then the phase encoding pulse is turned off, and they go back to the same Larmor frequency, but they are uh, now of different phases. So we've done what's referred to as phase encoding. So that actually helps with one of the two locations in, in the body. So we've done the slice select, the phase encoding, and then we do the frequency encoding. I'm going to have to move my. Uh, the uh, WebEx window here, but you can see on the right pointing down is the gradient. And if that 
is then used. This is the frequency encode. This is the last code. Notice when you do that, you have net magnetization vectors in that slice and notice each one of those now is rotating with different frequencies and they have different phases. So now you have uniquely determined the net magnetization vectors at every location inside that inside that slice. And so what you have is you have essentially phase information and frequency information. And that's what gives you the image. Now, unlike a photograph, you know, a photograph with a camera, take a quick shot and and you, you know, a few milliseconds or whatever, and it, you uh, you get a picture. Unlike a photograph, the MRI image actually has to be constructed. And what you're actually constructing is the FFT of the image. And that's what refers to a, a phase frequency or case space representation of the signal. And so for each phase, you have to have one measurement. Now, the case based representation of an image might be something like 256 by 256 uh, matrix. And so you have to feel, fill in each of the 256 lines at the same time, uh, excuse me, at different times. So if you think we used a one second example for the uh, decay time, if you take one second per phase sample, that's 256 seconds, or that's more than four minutes. And that explains why MRI images take so long to create, is that you have to measure the phase and the frequency one phase at a time, and um, that has to be reconstructed, and then an inverse FFT will give you the image. Now, there's a couple of ways to increase or to be decrease the scan time. And that is through uh, instead of getting every point in the phase frequency diagram, you do something called case space sampling. Uh, and there's other other techniques to reduce that time. But this is the fundamental approach. Now, as you might expect, phase and frequency and amplitude, since they're the the items that actually make up the image, and and that image takes minutes to acquire all of your equipment has to have phase frequency and amplitude stable behavior for that entire time so that's going to make the electronics especially the in, in in our case as microwave engineers the rf electronics it's going to make them very you know very challenging to design now to sort of give you an idea of a, of a cutaway view of what that mri system looks like uh there's a cutaway view and the uh, the main magnetic field, and this is this is an example for a seven Tesla field, has uh, it's going to be a superconducting magnet. It has several hundred kilometers, yes, kilometers of superconducting wire that make that up, and it's in a uh, liquid uh, liquid helium bath, and it needs approximately seven thousand liters, and uh, at a very high current. Now, as I said, we have, that's the main magnet, and then we have the X, Y, and Z gradient magnets. And then to adjust all of the, uh, the magnets, there's uh, what are referred to as shim coils. So there's a lot of coils in there. And then we have the transmit coils, the ones that actually provide the RF signal to do the slice select and so forth. And depending on the strength of the magnetic field, you have different types of transmitting antennas. Uh, most uh, MRI scanners in, in operation today are of, uh, in, cl in most clinical operations are less than three Tesla. And so something called a birdcage coil is used. And uh, research or other uh, advanced clinical, other, other types of transmit coils are used above three Tesla. And then, of course, you need a multiple number of receive coils to capture that radiated signal. So this slide actually shows a block diagram of what kind of electronics are required. So on the far left, we have the transmit coil. And of course, the uh, uh, person to be imaged is, goes inside that. And then surrounding the patient will be a number of receive coils. And the transmit coil is. And, and the receive coils are connected to the RF electronics. 
So for the receive coils, and this will be the bottom path, they go through that blue amplifier there, which is uh, you know one or more receivers. Here I show a single one, but it, it's a single one for each coil. So if you have multiple coils, you're gonna you could have multiple uh, uh, amplifiers there, and they're all going to be low noise figure, and they're all going to be high gain. And then they're going to go and do some sort of frequency mixer, frequency conversion, and turned into a digital representation. Now, the data control system will know from the uh, from the technician, for example, what kind and the doctor, what kind of uh, or locations have to be imaged. And so therefore, the RF pulse will be constructed in that uh, data control. And that will be sent to uh, to the transmitter uh, digitally, and then uh, up convert in frequency to the to the Larmor frequency. And so the red amplifier there shows the transmit amplifier, and of course, just after that is some sort of control that allows you to uh, you know separate things in the RF and transmit side. But notice in parentheses about the transmitter XMTR. Notice the power level. 32 kilowatts. In other words, the RF pulse is on the order of kilowatts being applied to the body. Very low duty cycle, very low duty cycle, but still it's an extremely high power pulse that has to be applied to get those uh, that magnetization vectors to uh, to flip. So if you have multiple coils, both on transmit and receive, you're going to have extensive cabling. Whenever you have coax cables, carrying high power signals and low power signals together or in close proximity. You're going to have unwanted coupling. Uh, you're going to have losses. And so there are ways underway right now to try to look at ways to minimize those, those undesirable features like coupling and losses. And those are the use of, uh, say, optical fibers or even wireless communications from inside the magnet bore to the uh, uh, to the equipment room. Sometimes you may even in, in, in some of these uh, wireless communication systems, there may be even wireless pa power transfer. In other words, they're not even battery operated or with wires. They uh, they actually take uh, RF energy that's harvested and to 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 power them. Now. I haven't talked about it yet, but a lot of it, but I did talk about the fact that we had a long scan time because you need to find spatial information. If you use coil arrays, you can actually get some of the spatial information from the coil array itself. And so that's going to further reduce scan time. So if we think about the transmitter for a second, we have actually a relatively narrow bandwidth pulse. In other words, most of the pulses in uh, typical MRI systems only have a few hundred kilohertz of bandwidth for that slice select, because typically you want to make those slices relatively thin for very good image resolution. But because of the wide ranging gyromagnetic ratio, and you don't know if you want to image hydrogen, helium, sodium, phosphorus, whatever, those amplifiers have to have a very wide frequency range so that they're, they're, they're very general. Again, relatively low average power, but very high pulse power. They have to have a relatively narrow pulse width. Mostly 20 milliseconds is, uh, although they can be quite large depending on what, what's being asked to be scanned. They have to rise and fall very quickly. Some of that is actually handled through the electronics of the amplifier itself. And there's also structures at the output to blank that so that you actually have very quickly, very rapid turnoff of the RF signal. The output amplitude, remember we said we had to have uh, amplitude stability over a long period of time. So the output has to be very stable over that entire scan length, very high gain. You actually can't have much phase difference either. Why? Because we were looking at phase frequency diagrams. So any phase changes caused by the amplifiers are going to potentially find their way into the image. 
And of course, you want that amplifier to faithfully reproduce the RF signal. And so it has to be of a, a relatively linear nature. And so primarily class A type amplifiers are used. And if you've done your work in class A power amplifiers, you find out that uh, they're relatively inefficient in the uh, 20 to 30% range. And so the other 70 to 80% of the energy has to be dealt with in terms of heat. So in this slide on the bottom left, that is a, uh, a picture of what a, a 16 channel, two kilowatt per channel power amplifier for an MRI application might actually be. So that's not gonna typically be in what's called the scan room, that'll that be just over the side of the wall. And so the cabling of course would have to go between that equipment room and the scan room. On the right shows a series of amplifiers that are actually uh, built around the, uh, the magnet itself, okay? Uh, those are low duty cycles, they're smaller amplifiers and they're low duty cycles. So the various places, they can either be uh, outside or inside. If they're inside as shown on the bottom right, uh, they tend to be lower power. And also notice that they're at the edge of the, uh, of the core there of that, uh, of that cylinder. And uh, that cylinder would go inside the magnet. And the reason they're at the edge there is any magnetic properties of those amplifiers have to be as far away from the center of that as possible so it doesn't disturb the static magnetic field strength of the, uh, the magnet. This is an example of what's referred to as a birdcage coil that uh, is the essentially the transmit coil, and it could be used for a receive coil, but uh, primarily it's a transmit coil that's used to excite the, uh, the nucleons so uh, their net magnetization vectors line up and flip. And you can see that it contains a number of horizontal legs or rungs as they're called. And then around the, uh, the cylinder itself, there are what are referred to as end rings. So there's one on the left and one on the right. And in between each one of there's, uh, it might be hard to see, they're little white, uh, white elements, but between each one of the end rings, there are capacitors and, the, and those are used to tune that transmit coil to the Larmor frequency. And above that picture, that's basically a uh, uh, an equivalent circuit for that. And the end rings are on that top run where you have an inductor and a uh, capacitor here. And then the legs are essentially these are modeled as these inductors and a very small value of resistance. On the bottom right, we've got this graph showing the resonant uh, or the reflection coefficient. And it's pretty easy to see that this birdcage coil is a, has multiple resonances. And so what you need to do is you need to tune that to the Larmor frequency uh, if it's not already there. Usually it's fairly close, but it ha may have to be tuned. Now, that kind of birdcage coil, let me go back to that, that kind of birdcage coil, it turns out that the resonant frequency of that birdcage coil is a function of the length and the diameter. As the frequency goes up, that is the magnetic field strength goes up, the Larmor frequency goes up, the wavelength becomes smaller, and therefore that cylinder to keep in resonance would have to be uh, reduced. And of course, if you make that diameter too small, then you cannot fit the patient inside that magnet. And so up to about three Tesla bird cages are, are used, uh, but above that, because of that physical limitation due to the, to the uh, reducing wavelength, you have to then try other techniques. And these are some of the other techniques that are used. One's called a TEM coil. And if you look at that in the upper uh, left, upper left uh, part of the, of the slide, uh, you'll see a head phantom in there with those little circles. Those are actually receive coils, but you'll see the strips along uh, 
the inside of the cylinder, and each one of those are essentially a microstrip transmission line that is radiating into the center of that structure uh, with the head phantom to, to uh, flip the net magnetization vector. The cylinder of the, uh, of the system looks like a cylindrical waveguide, and so if you place a patch antenna at the far end of that, you can then radiate the RF signal into the bore of the uh, of the of the of the magnet, and that is actually gives rise to what's referred to as traveling wave MRI, where you you have the excitation at one end instead of in the center, and they use the waveguide properties of the uh, cylindrical wave properties of the of the bore to transmit the signal, the high power RF signal down the, down the uh, down the bore. And then the bottom one is just another idea that's been used as a helix, and the helix uh, would be inside uh, the bore of the magnet, and of course then the phantom or the patient would be put inside that helix. And of course the pitch, the diameter, and so forth all have to be adjusted for operation at the Lorimer frequency. Now, in the uh, the magnet, remember that net magnetization vector is rotating. And so you'd also like to have the applied RF signal rotate along with it. And here's an example of an eight rung coil where the little orange blocks represent the, uh, the, the transmitting elements. And so notice if I have with my transmitter I apply a signal through a 90 degree hybrid, what happens is, and I, and I feed it at 90 degrees apart, what happens is I can actually get a circularly polarized uh, magnetic field inside that birdcage coil. And that circular polarization will then match with the net magnetization vector as it sweeps through the center of that birdcage coil. So that helps match it up and it helps improve the uh, through polarization matching basically, and it helps improve the transfer of energy to give you a larger signal, which is, a, is essentially an increase. If you didn't include that, you would have a polarization mismatch, and so you'd lose 3 dB of signal and hence 3 dB of signal to noise ratio. Of course, you also have to have tuning and matching and all sorts of traps to make sure that there's uh, no unwanted coupling. And then of course on the receive, the net magnetization vector is still spinning. And so you look at the signal as it comes out and through an LNA. And of course, if you notice, I have transmit receive switches there because uh, the 90 degree hybrid's not gonna be perfect. And since the transmit power is so high and the LNAs are looking at very weak signals, you want to make sure that there's absolutely no feed through into the RF side. Of course, whenever you put a person in that magnet, you may have a person that goes in and then the next person comes in, maybe a child, and so they have different electronic properties. And so as you put people in and out, you're going to have slightly different changes in resonant frequency, and so the coils are going to have to be tuned each time uh, to 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 match whatever you know person size, uh, body weight, so forth is inside that magnet. And so there's classic uh, antenna antenna tuner type of applications uh, where you have, in the case that's shown here in the schematic you have combinations of capacitors because the, the, uh, the rung there, which is microstrip, is usually assumed to be primarily uh, inductive. And so to match it, you would put in various uh, series and shunt connected uh, capacitors. And of course, you want, to do, you want to do this in an automated fashion so, that the, so it's done rapidly and so that the person operating the machine doesn't have to do it manually. Uh, and uh, you need some sort of electronics, electronic switches then to switch those capacitors inside and out. And remember, this is actually going to be in the transmit path. So there's going to be the multi kilowatts of pulse power that are going to be pushed through there. And so whatever those switches are, which I've denoted by diodes here, whatever those switches are, I'm going to have to be able to handle that very high power. 
And this is sort of where I became involved very much in MRI is because I've, been, I've done a lot of work over the years in high power switching uh, with uh, PIN high di diodes, both high speed and high switching. Now, if you remember uh, from your electro uh, electronics courses, uh, the PIN diode is constructed the way the name is. It's a P-type region and an N-type region with a, uh, an intrinsic region sandwiched in between the two. And when you apply a forward bias to this, the resistance of that, that's the microwave resistance of that, is proportional to the, the separation between the P and the N regions, or sometimes called the I region width, and the DC bias current. So very large BC, DC bias currents give very low resistances. If you reverse bias it, then you get primarily a capacitance, which is also small. So essentially that PIN diode can look like an on-off switch going between forward and reverse biased. And so these diodes actually are used quite liberally around uh, MRI for both on both transmit and receive functions. Okay, and I'm going to talk about a few of those as we go along. So the circuit schematic that I've shown, uh, sort of in the middle there, with two back-to-back -back diodes, those you might find on the receive side, in what's referred to as a limiter application, because if the signal coming from the left on those transmission lines is relatively high, and on the right side is the receiver, then the turn-on characteristics of those devices will clip the signal to pretty much help limit the amount of RF energy that gets to the receiver. I've uh, done a lot of work over the years, of course, that these are in an, in an RF environment, their temperatures go up, and that's sort of what the graph shows there. And this is uh, just based on some models that I have uh, developed over the years. Now, if we look at this structure, this is sort of a classic TR switch, transmit receive switch, where we have uh, uh, essentially a, uh, a, a dual quad hybrid where we have the two transmission lines here and here, along with capacitors here. And this VN here, which is on the upper left, would be the transmitter. And so if I turn those diodes on, all those diodes get turned on, one, two, and three. That transmit signal splits in the hybrid, comes to these short circuits, and then totally reflects back, but then goes out the coil. So with those diodes on, you're going to actually have this node here connected to the birdcage coil, for example. If you're using the birdcage coil for receive, and you can do that, it's not often done, but you can do that, you're gonna get a signal coming back from the coil when the transmit's off, and of course, it's got a signal is going to come back from the coil. It's going to split up. But at this point, if you don't have the diodes on, then the signal goes straight to the amplifier. The signal goes straight to the amplifier. So by turning these diodes on and off, you can have this passive structure here with these diodes actually be able to control the flow of the transmitted receive signal. And these are some examples of what that switch actually looks like. So here's one that was a prototype that, uh, that I built uh, based on a microstrip structure. There's the, uh, the two transmission lines. There's the tuning capacitors. There are diodes here. There are diodes here in the center as well as on the right side, upper right side. And uh, that is one implementation using microstrip, the middle implementation is using what's referred to as hard line. So it's basically hard outer shield, but again, it's got capacitors at the junctions and in the middle and then diodes. And the bottom is a little bit more compact version that used uh, two different quad hybrids that were then sort of sandwiched, not sandwiched, but placed right together. And the diodes and were, were added externally. And you can see the size of that is very, very small. 
So whereas the top two, it may have been hard to envision those going inside the magnet, that bottom one is not. That could actually go inside the magnet. Right? So that would eliminate any long coax runs. Why is that important? Well, because long coax runs can introduce loss. And of course, that's going to increase the, uh, the noise associated with the signal. Now, on the receive side, there's a different set of issues that have to be, uh, have to be dealt with. Uh, one of the things about the receive side is SNR, signal noise ratio, is everything. And it turns out a lot of work has been, uh, been uh, done to look at coils and where the signal to noise ratio is the best. And it turns out if I have a coil like this, and this is what uh, maybe 10 centimeters in diameter, it turns out that the peak signal to noise ratio is going to be about at the radius point. Okay, so so here's the loop, here's the coil loop, but I turn or I rotate it 90 degrees, and that point right there is about a few, you know, maybe about five centimeters. And that's where the highest signal to noise ratio is going to occur. Now that's interesting because it says if I want to image my, uh, you know, a finger, for example, I need a small coil. Why? Because I don't have to go very far in for the peak signal. If I'm imaging the head or the torso, I'm going to need a different diameter coil to make sure I get the the peak SNR. So, for the peak SNR. You're going to need to have different shape coils for different locations. And so some of the pictures that I've shown here on the bottom left from EJ Blink just show some of those with, with different sizes. And if you have multiple coils, and sometimes this is referred to as a phased array, just by the spatial variation of that phased array, of that array of coils, you could actually get spatial information back and as i mentioned before that'll kind of cut back on the uh, need for a long scan time but those coils have to be such that they do not interact with each other i mean you only want them to interact with the net magnetization vector and not each other so what happens is you actually have coils that slightly overlap so instead of having just a, an array of these coils, you actually have them overlap slightly. And that reduces the mutual coupling significantly. And you can test this out yourself if you take uh, like a uh, uh, two coils and connect uh, each one to, the, to uh, uh, a two port network analyzer and do an S21 measurement. And you can see that if you place them like this, you're gonna get some S21, but if you slightly overlap them, the S21 is going to drop. And that's used to make sure you have no un unwanted coupling between the uh, each individual coil. Now, this, I think, is, is a very illustrative picture of what a combination of transmit receive coil uh, set looks like. Uh, this is for head imaging, so patient's head would go inside. Inside this would actually this one these two pieces would then slide together, and then the patient's uh, head would go inside. But on the outer cylinder, this actually has the transmit. This is a TEM, and you can see each of the lines there, as well as um, you know balance, and you can see the RF cables going from each one of those lines. Uh, out to the left. Now, on the inner cylinder, and hopefully you can see my cursor here on the inner cylinder, notice you have an array of coils here. Notice they are overlapping. And as we described before, that overlapping is so that you minimize the coupling between the two. And as I said before, you can, you can measure that using, for example, a network, uh, a network analyzer. Now, notice that the transmitter, which is that outer conductor or the outer cylinder, is carrying kilowatts or will will produce kilowatts of power. And that inner cylinder, which is only a centimeter or two away, is going to be pick, wanting to pick up weak signals. 
And remember, both of those coils are tuned to the same exact frequency. So if nothing is done with those receive coils, you'll get A, unwanted coupling between the receive and transmit coils, but even worse, B, you're gonna get significant signal pickup in those receive coils, and they're gonna to have to dissipate huge amounts of energy, and which can be problematic. I mean, I hear stories of, uh, of uh, you know, melting, thing, things melting because they picked up so um, RF energy. So one of the ways that's, that is used to protect those receive coils, again, uses PIN diodes. And so here's a sort of an example of what that uh, protection might look like. Here's one of those receive coils, and it has a series of capacitors that help tune that coil to the Larmor frequency. But if we look at this middle port, uh, the middle uh, circuit, for example, we have the coil. And then notice we have a diode here that can, if that diode is turned on, okay, so notice if this diode is turned off, we have just the signal going to the coil. If that diode is turned on, notice that inductor L1 is placed in shunt with that 160 picofarad capacitor. Why is that important? Well, it detunes the coil. So on transmit, you would actually activate that diode and shift the resonant frequency of that coil away from the Larmor frequency. And then when you want to receive, you just turn that diode off and it goes back to its Larmor frequency. So during transmit, it's actually protected. So that's not going to end, that's not going to talk to the transmit coils at all. And it's not going to pick up any coil. And so therefore it's going to be uh, protecting that coil. I forgot to mention, notice I said earlier, I said the diameter of the coil and the peak signal to noise ratio is important. What you want to do usually is place those coils as close as you can to the patient. So those coils have to be very close to the patient. And of course, if they pick up unwanted energy, they're going to potentially heat up and that can be a problem with the patient. So these protection circuits on receive coils are very, very important, not just for the electronics, but also for patient safety. And the circuits on the right show a couple of other different ways to, to detune. Uh, actually, the, the two methods there are uh, often used together because on the, on the right, the, uh, the two diodes D1 and D2 are in a passive configuration. And when, that's, when they detect RF signals, they bring that detuning inductor in parallel. And that's a passive structure. The one below it is one that's active. So you might actually have both of those in there to ensure if the passive one doesn't uh, react in time or uh, somehow is uh, malfunctioning that you've got the active one to do the coil detuning. Now I've talked about the coils and the diodes that go uh, on the coils that go next very close to the human body. I've talked about uh, the uh, uh, Antenna to, uh, the, uh, the coil tuning and so forth, so there's electronics inside. One of the things that has to be thought of in this case is what's referred to as in-bore electronics, because it may not be uh, obvious, but most electrical components have some sort of magnetic material that make them up. And so that magnetic material, if placed in the bore of the magnet, are going to provide these local regions of different magnetic fields. So that tight gradient relationship between the slice selection and so forth can be disrupted if I put mag uh, electronics that have these packaging materials that are magnetic and that and magnetic can be iron, nickel, or cobalt. And so the, the electronics and most of the components have to actually be MRI certified so that you reduce that. Now, how is that done? Well, nickel, iron, ferromagnetic, they retain magnetism, but para and diamagnetic materials actually have different 
uh, behaviors. One has a uh, sort of a positive magnetic field coefficient, the other one negative. And so in a lot of these electronics, there's some sort of alloys of the two to keep the uh, uh, keep the residual magnetism out of, uh, you know, keep it, keep it minimized. And so if you're looking for electronics for MRI, you really have to look at MRI compatible electronics because, because of this magnetic field issue. And I like this particular slide because it uh, shows some other issues that have to be dealt with. You've got this very high magnetic field strength magnet, and that high magnetic field isn't just confined to the center, but it, it actually, you know, goes for a consider is influencing considerable distance. So any magnetic material, not just inside the magnet, but outside, uh, you know, just like you know, a magnet will pull, you know, you know, small objects, that magnet can pull very large objects. And so uh, I noticed there was a question that's come up and I'll, I'll try to answer that. Uh, <clears throat> we'll be finished. So because of that, that ability for that magnet to actually grab materials and pull them toward them, uh, very you know, you have to be, there has to be very uh, intensive safety protocols for, uh, you know, things, you know, what goes in the, what goes in the scan room. Uh, certainly can't have oxygen cylinders, for example, because they'll be pulled into the magnet. But that's even, that even includes other types of, uh, of, of things that's used to help uh, isolate uh, wires and coax cable because usually what's done if you want to make sure that you you fully isolate and you don't have any uh, what's referred to as shield currents is you usually take a coax line and you wrap it around a, a ferrite toroid core but again that's I, I just used the word ferrite so that's a problem so there has to be a little bit more uh, thought given to how you keep the uh, high power rf currents off the uh, off the shield of a coax line and so on the right there's a couple of different uh, circuits that are used uh, probably the most the one most widely used one I've seen is a so-called solenoid or tor toroid where you basically uh, cut the uh, you cut the shield in two different spots and maybe wrap the shield as uh, in one or two loops, and then cut the uh, cut the coating on the shield, and place a tuning capacitor on the outer shield, which then gets rid of the and, and tunes out the shield currents. Uh, I'm getting near the end, and so a couple of other research trends. Uh, I talked about the microwave and the RF characteristics. There's a lot of computer-aided design modeling. Uh, is uh, to, to look at the influence, especially in high magnetic fields and high power to uh, to see, you know, the best way to, to, to generate pulses and how they interact with the human body. As the fields go higher, as the frequencies go higher, there's a lot more loss. And of course, that means the human body picks up more uh, uh, heating energy. So how is that influence what's going on in the MRI system. I mentioned before there's wireless data and power transfer. Uh, that helps reduce the cabling, but it introduces other, other issues. Uh, novel transmit structures. I um, mean, there people are using metamaterials for shielding. There's the traveling wave type I talked about before. And as we go to larger and larger, and uh, it's gonna be larger and larger frequencies, and the wavelengths start to get smaller, you're going from uh, purely magnetic field type induction coupling to actually starting looking at the net magnetization vector as an electromagnetic wave. And so on the receive side, you're actually starting to see kind of dipole-like structures or Yagi-like structures that are used on the receive side instead of coils. So hopefully in the last 50, 55 minutes, I've uh, given you a little bit of appreciation of the MRI process and how uh, RF systems uh, and microwaves go into that. Uh, 
as I've said, they've got many different coils, and those are the, uh, the clinical ones. The research ones have combinations of coils and antennas and other structures. As you can see, the RF energy is a necessary part of MRI. I mean, you can't you can't do an MRI without the uh, without the RF. And this is actually kind of interesting because the MRI compu uh, community is quite multidisciplinary. I talked about antennas, so of course there's uh, people from the Antennas and Propagation Society that would be involved. There's uh, uh, image processing. I didn't even touch on that. Uh, there's the computer-aided design in terms of using CAD models to determine heating. There's, of course, the atomic physics. There's the chemistry. And then, of course, I didn't even talk about the medical side because the, uh, the you know, doctors and clinicians want to see these images. So uh, it's, it's a very multidisciplinary field. The magnetic resonance imaging conferences are uh, very interesting because you have a huge, huge range of uh, people as well as topics being discussed. In some ways, it's like radar, where you have high power transmit and low receive signals. That's that's really no different than radar. Where it does differ from radar is it's not reflective, because if it were reflective, you couldn't use the lower frequencies that I talked about. Uh, rather, it's using magnetic field induction rather than reflection and actually radiating from the atoms itself. Uh, I got interested again, in it, like I said, because of the, of the PIN diode, but I found it to be a fascinating, fascinating topic to learn more. So I uh, have a couple of uh, references here. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of IEEE publications and conferences. I've listed a few. There's IM BioC, uh, and even in the IMS flagship conference, there are often biomedical and MRI type of uh, papers, ISMRM, which is the Magnetic Residence in Medicine Conference. And I can share with Dr. Saha this, uh, this list of, uh, of uh, you know, further information. So thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Thank Saha? You. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Beverly. It's a, such a wonderful talk, the way you uh, started the talk with some fundamentals. I remember some of those things we studied in our physics course. <laughs> the magnetism, Bohr magnetron, etc. Yes. Yeah, different kind of quantum numbers also come into picture. Spin quantum numbers, especially you mentioned. So uh, I think uh, we have few queries from our students and uh, some of the office bearers. I also I see they have posted. Uh, would you like to take them on your own, or you want me to moderate and read them? Yes, yeah, so I I can see one here. It says MRI yeah. sometimes causes little discomfort. Uh, so I I think you probably mean physical discomfort. Uh, I think so. Yeah. And, and if you think if you think about that, the bore of that magnet, it's pretty confining. Yeah. And and people who don't like confined spaces can can feel very uncomfortable in there. Uh, if it's really bad, I hear people are actually, uh, you know, provided a light uh, sedative to to calm them down, or sometimes they're given music to listen to or something like that. Uh, another issue is the noise, uh, and that may also be dis uh, discomforting. And that the noise that you hear is actually not the RF amplifiers. It's actually when those gradient magnets turn on and off, they're turning off very rapidly. And so there's a lot of torque. And so they actually pop and, and actually make physical grinding noises. And again, headphones to kind of block that noise out uh, is often used. And I, I think some people are actually looking at noise canceling uh, uh, ways by putting sort of audio amplifiers and then looking at the signal and then adjusting the phase through noise canceling. So so I think that might be the discomfort you were talking about. So yeah. so there are I those are some of the ideas that I've heard of. Yeah, I think the point you mentioned regarding the sound system or some music system is really good. <laughs> yeah, and then there's there, there's some work being done there. Yeah, yeah, Can you yeah. compare MRI with other imaging? Well, CT and X-ray are both ionizing 
radiation. Uh, and of course, you can't, you know, there's limits as to, to, to that. MRI is not. Um, on the other hand, the resolution uh, of MRI is also very dependent on essentially the field strength to, right. because of the signal to noise ratio. And so you can you can get extremely good sub millimeter resolution uh, with uh, with very high field. So uh, you you can get comparable resolutions, if not better, with MRI. But but there are a lot there are lots of different things that you have to uh, you know lots of imaging processing that's mm -hmm. involved, and lots of other techniques. So it's it's not trivial. Plus high magnetic fields. Uh, it's, but it's non ionizing and that's, that's 1 of the keys and you can have quite a few done as opposed to having to, to limit uh, x rays. 1 of the things with x rays and CTs is they also can show movement. Uh, and an MRI can now, uh, be able to see heartbeats, although probably not the same resolution. Right. I think some of the questions are repeated. Maybe 1 person has posted from 2 devices, so you may skip those. Okay. Uh, so I've got one about the development. I actually do not have an MRI facility at, at my institution. Uh, I was actually working one of the with one of the people I I acknowledged at the very beginning, Ron Watkins. Uh, he was with the Stanford University MRI Center, so he he was the one that that I interacted with uh, on that. And I so I, I really can't answer that question. But, but looking 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 at the complexity of it, I can tell you it's years <laughs> that they are very complex uh, facilities. And very expensive too. Yeah. Okay. And last question from Manjurati. We have one more in the chat box. Did I miss one? Should I take that one? Yeah, I don't see, I don't, I think that was the last one I saw. Uh, I think the, the, that, you know, the text reads like this. First part is appreciation. Professor Kavadli, thank you very much for your detailed presentation. Why and how the name part cage coil came? What are okay. the key modeling and design issues? I'll take one after another, maybe. Okay, so uh, let me, let me ask the first one. Yeah. Bird cage. Okay. It's, I, I, it's a, uh, if you think about a bird cage, a cage for birds, it yeah. has, you know, a, a top and then it's got the, the vertical, the vertical rungs. And so that's where the term bird cage coil came from, but it's, it's essentially a cylindrical resonator. But because it looked like a bird cage, it was called a bird cage coil. <laughs> All right, so what was the second part of that question? The second part is what are the key modeling and design issues? Uh, that's it. What are the, I mean, it's, if, if the, you know, a person is present, you play, you may please unmute and elaborate your question. Sure, if, if they want to ask that, yes. Yeah, otherwise the part he's asking is uh, that modeling. What are the key modeling and design issues? Maybe related to the system design or what can you just elaborate um well i mean there it depends on which yeah. aspect i mean for example if you're designing the magnet itself uh you know that's a superconducting system so there has to be all the you know the vacuum structures and because i mean that, that's a that's a that's that we could go for hours on that question on that question uh but but you know so th there's the design of the magnet itself and those magnets especially those about 7 tesla and above are over 1 million us dollars okay just for the magnet and that doesn't include the electronics that goes inside if you're looking at for example the uh, the bird cage coil that i talked about that can be actually modeled in any of the any of the uh, three dimension three D uh, modelers such as HFSS and so forth. It could easily be modeled in in that. They often and they often are. Uh, 
the yeah. uh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so the one more I see, uh, I think it is also related to the patients, uh, uh, you know, individuals, individuals. I mean, what if the patient moves when the MRI has been performed? Do we have the imaging to repeat? Do we have okay. to repeat the image? Maybe I rephrased it. Yeah. Okay, G good question. The, uh, this is out of my realm part of it because that gets into the image processing yeah and i i there there are some ways to correct for minor movements during that time from the from a signal pro image processing but if there is extensive movement then you pretty much have to start uh, do another scan okay exactly. uh okay. yes you do pretty much have to do another scan uh for example if the patient uh, sneezes <laughs> You know that's going to be a very large movement, and and so that's going to be a problem, and might have to. And so, um, and th that actually, if, if, if in a, in some MRIs, it could take a half an hour or forty minutes for a scan, and some of that might be because the technician sees the image and says the patient moved, and we'll have to you know, just have to do it again. Fortunately, it's non-ionizing radiation, and so that's that's less of an issue. Yeah, I have I have a couple of questions. We have taken all the questions from chat box. Uh, one is technical question. Another is a little bit leadership uh, from your experience. I would request to enlighten the audience. So the first question is like uh, we see a lot of uh, imaging uh, related articles in terahertz area also coming into uh, picture nowadays uh, using terahertz technology, uh, terahertz spectroscopy, etc. So do you think at some point uh, this uh, terahertz technology will have a big role in application in medical diagnosis or uh, at some point it may replace some of the current imaging technologies? So this is the first part. That's, that's a really good question. I mean, if you look at the standard MRI, uh, about the highest magnetic field strength I know in the US is about 20 Tesla. And so that's that's about 900 megahertz, which is which is which is nowhere near the terahertz range. Okay, right. so so for sort of the classic MRI, it's it's going to be sub gigahertz. Okay? Sub gigahertz, yeah. Sub gigahertz. Uh, yeah. It's like GSM frequency. Right now, if there's another there's electron spin resonance mm -hmm. imaging electron resonance imaging where you look the electron spins that because the electron has a different you know different properties then you're looking into the multi gigahertz but there there are still some problems with uh with doing living tissue uh imaging with electron spin terahertz uh i know less about but just thinking about it uh imaging of the skin is is possible but because because the because because of the losses i i can't see getting much penetration exactly exactly for terahertz so it may be only on the surface level application like skin cancer detection or something like that yes and, and that's why terahertz imagers are also widely used for uh, security purposes is because if somebody's got you know, somebody has a weapon or something, which would be on the skin. They're they're very very good for picking those up. Right, right. Okay. So the, the last part of the question is, uh, you know, in India the MRI is like uh, one uh, you know, test cost around two hundred US dollar. Is it the same in your place or don't you think? Uh, yeah, it's really yes. For the common people. A magnetic resonance imaging scan is more. A scan is on a scan by scan basis is more expensive than an X ray, it, it, because the equipment is so much more sophisticated. Like I said, the magnet itself can be a million dollars, and then U.S. dollars, and then there's all the other electronics that go along with it. So, so the machines are expensive, uh, okay. but they they can they can they Im they can image things that X rays can't. Uh, you know, X-rays are very good for bones, for example. 
but they're they're less so for softer tissue, and that's where MRI really really comes in. So, uh, if you're looking for you know a broken a broken arm, X-ray mm -hmm. is fine. But if you're trying to find a soft tissue cancer or yeah, yeah. Uh, something like that, that yeah, would be brain the MRI. imaging or neuroimaging, everything is mainly. Oh, I'm sorry, I I missed that. I was telling the brain imaging or neuroimaging. These are all done uh, with MRI only. That's that's right, and that's because of the soft tissue, and and the detail you can get with the soft tissue that you just can't get with the uh, yeah. X-ray. So yeah, thank you so much. We have addressed all the technical queries. I would just uh, request you to uh, you know give some points for the youngsters uh, for you know for the benefits of being with MTTS. We always tell that MTTS is a, such a wonderful society. Uh, it has so many initiatives for students, for PhD students, for uh, even undergraduate students, different kind of awards, different kind of travel grant, etc. And I tell my Indian students that uh, MTTS has special initiative for India also in terms of IMARC and now it is being changed to MAPCON or whatever. So from the highest level and from such a long journey of uh, yours, if you can tell tell some points for the young students, they will be more motivated than encouraged. I just uh, okay. Uh, this is not basically from an MTT, IEEE, or anybody's perspective. This is mine, but you know, enjoy what it is you're doing. <laughs> you know, that's that's important because if you enjoy what you're doing, it doesn't seem like as much work. I mean, that's that's very important. Sure. Secondly, is uh, get involved. I mean, you know, you are in, you were involved in starting, or the, you know, people were involved in starting the Kerala chapter. But you know, be involved. Uh, get you know, volunteer to to help out with, uh, you know, with the Kerala chapter or the other chapters, and in in, no, in any kind of way, uh, you know, help help organize this, help spread the word, help uh, help and organize in the committee, Vo volunteer. Uh, that's that's very important. Uh, if you find something interesting, try to learn as much as you can about it. Right. And uh, that and and in my case, uh, I had been doing uh, a lot of work in PI and diodes for communication kite circuits for years, and uh, and then I was approached by somebody in the MRI community to to look on that, and I I got fascinated by it. And so I spent a lot of time, you know, on trying to understand it. So and it's it's uh, it's 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 fascinating. There's a lot of parts that uh, I don't know about, but there's some parts that I do, and it's uh, it's a fascinating. So so you know, research, you know, read up on what uh, what interests you. True. True. Thank you so uh, much. So let's say yeah. And and just and work hard. <laughs> work hard. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a lesson learned, and uh, I would advise the youngsters, some of our students present over here, to you know follow that main word. I mean the key term, you know, with passion. Uh, with we have passion. To to but you know, you talk, you, you, even the IEEE student branch at at their institution, be part of that. You know, try to uh, if you're a if you're a, a fourth year student. Try to uh, talk to a first year student and let them know about what the career is like and so, so forth. So try to network. I think that's very important. Exactly. And yes, passion. That's 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 a key word. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, I would like to thank you so much. I mean, uh, we are really very you know, pleased and uh, it was a great two hour session. Uh, almost and uh, we have little formality left we will do always uh, i uh, hand over the podium to the volunteers so we will take a virtual photo shoot and uh, so okay. for that uh, everyone has to turn on their camera and give the best possible pose you can <laughs> and i also want to say i think it's probably 9 30 p.m there so uh, i yeah. also thank you for for you know staying so late on a friday evening <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure and we want to really do an event with you in our chapter uh, maybe in december 2022 itself if not later yeah. yes 
Okay. Yes, we we can further talk now that we have our communication. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, channel better than it was early on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think some of our volunteers are taking care of this virtual photo shoot. So people, you may all of us may turn on the video. And let us know when it is done. To our session. Hello. Uh, and we have a little formality. So can uh, I request everyone to switch on the cameras? We'll be taking a photo very soon. I'll give a minute more to for everyone to switch on the cameras. Okay. But will you get in a single frame or you have to have multiple frames? For now, I can adjust in a single frame. I mean, it'll be okay. yeah. them up switch on the cameras. We have almost hard and hundred participants. Many? Yeah. <laughs> Did you say 500? No, hundred. Um, hey, a hundred. Well, still, that's that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. And there are many people who will be watching this in YouTube because it will be directly going to our YouTube lecture, YouTube link. So I'll be taking the photo right now. Uh, hello, uh, can you please hear me? Yes. Sure. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Can you please introduce? Go ahead. Hello, Mr. Uh, 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 Sir Robert Carley. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. Yes. Yes, Mr. Harpreet, you want to say something? Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, yes, I am a, uh, a myself, I am a research scientist from uh, Samir. Actually, I want, I have a query, uh, how to uh, determine the flip angle, uh, like. I, yes, actually, I have a doubt. I'm so sorry, uh, some uh, network issue is there at my end. Uh, I want to uh, know how to uh, determine the flip angle like uh, we have research on uh, 90 degree and 180 degree. How to get a flip angle 20 degree, 30 degree and uh, like this uh, so as uh, for a, um, um, a non-linear uh, non -linear, uh, amplifier, how we can determine. Can you please uh, uh, help me in that? Thank you. Uh, if I understand the question, uh with the uh the flip angle there's lots of different what are referred to as pulse sequences and these pulse sequences are optimized for particular for particular images and i use the 90 degree uh as an ex as the uh sort of the foundational example but you can have 180 degree flip angles, which you have a different kind of pulse sequence than you have 20 or 30. Uh, 20 or 30 degree flip angles you would you potentially use for uh, images that that needed uh, a quick response time. Okay, uh, fatty, you know, dense tissue or lean tissue, signal decays rapidly in dense tissue. Uh, with respect to lean tissue. And so things like flip angle or looking at the decay duration can enhance can enhance the image in say dense or uh, or lean medium. Uh, so that's actually one one big area of research in the physics and uh, uh, community is what's the optimum flip angle for uh, among other factors. Uh, the optimum flip flip angle to try to detect a certain uh, uh, try to enhance a certain image. I hope I hope that explains it, uh, uh, Mr. Harpreet. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. Thank you uh, so much. You have been so generous and spending uh, almost two hours with us uh, in the early morning in your place. And uh, that the last part of the formality is a vote of thanks. So from our uh, chapter office, uh, we'll have a vote of thanks for the event. Over to you, the volunteers. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful session. It was really enli enlightening and engaging at the same time. So now I welcome upon Anu Mohammed, sir, chapter advisor of IEEE, APS and MTTS, student and chapters of GEC Barton Hill and the vice chair of APS Kerala chapter to address the vote of thanks. Handing over to you, sir. Thank you, Saudi. Uh, on behalf of APMTT Kerala chapters, we are thankful to you, Kavarli, sir, for giving us this talk and I am sure that the these kind of lectures L4 series talks will have huge impact on the future generation and they will definitely think of shaping their careers or or research aspects in RF and micro domain. I also thank all the faculty members, research scholars, scientists or industrialists all over the globe in attending our session. Uh, um, I uh, am very happy and appreciate the students who attended this event and urge them to join the APMTT societies and get benefited. As Kavarli sir was mentioning those things. I thank the office bearers of APMTT Kerala section for making it more vibrant in, in from since 2015 onwards. Then I would also like to thank the region 10 co coordinators, AP, APS and MTTS headquarters, headquarters bearers for all for always having that kind, generous and support to this section. I would like to thank the past chairs and present chairs of our APMBT Kerala section. And we are in fact, we'll we are doing we'll be doing since this is our start with 2022 and we will be doing such kind of activities both online and offline. So please stay tuned with the APMTT societies of Kerala section. And lastly, I appreciate all the volunteers, student members for coordinating this event in a very, very good manner. Thank you all and over to you, the coordinators and Saha sir for further proceedings. Yeah, so there is no further proceedings. Uh, once again, thank you, everybody, uh, all the participants. And you'll get the participation certificate for Professor Kavali's information. We give the digital participation certificate for all the youngsters. So that carries some weightage in their academic uh, credit. So we'll be sending it. I'll be coordinating uh, with you on that particular part. So, and that's it. Thank you very much uh, to Professor Kavadli okay. and all the participants again. Thank I you. thank everybody in your society, your branch, and the students. And I saw a few thank yous coming in on the chat. So, uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I enjoyed the session myself. Yeah, thank you. Looking forward to welcome you in uh, Caroline in person. Yes, yes <laughs> I, hope, I hope we can meet sometime in the future. Bye, sure. now. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. The participants, please do note that the link to the feedback